Chapter 6 Membranes Concept Outline Section 6.1 Biological membranes are fluid layers of lipid. The phospholipid bilayer. Cells are encased by membranes composed of a bilayer of phospholipid. The lipid bilayer is fluid. Because individual phospholipid molecules do not bind to one another, the lipid bilayer of membranes is a fluid. Section 6.2 Proteins embedded within the plasma membrane determine its character. The fluid mosaic model. A varied collection of proteins float within the lipid bilayer. Examining cell membranes. Visualizing a plasma membrane requires a powerful electron microscope. Kinds of membrane proteins. The proteins in a membrane function in support, transport, recognition, and reactions. Structure of membrane proteins. Membrane proteins are anchored into the lipid bilayer by their nonpolar regions. Section 6.3. Passive transport across membranes moves down the concentration gradient. Diffusion. Random molecular motion results in a net movement of molecules to regions of lower concentration. Facilitated diffusion. Passive movement across a membrane is often through specific carrier proteins. Osmosis. Polar solutes interact with water and can affect the movement of water across semi-permeable membranes. Section 6.4. Bulk transport utilizes endocytosis. Bulk passage into and out of the cell. To transport large particles, membranes form vesicles. Section 6.5. Active transport across membranes is powered by energy from ATP. Active transport. Cells transport molecules up a concentration gradient using ATP-powered carrier proteins. Coupled transport. Active transport of ions drives coupled uptake of other molecules up their concentration gradients. Among a cell's most important activities are its interactions with the environment, a give and take that never ceases. Without it, life could not persist. While living cells and eukaryotic organelles, figure 6.1, are encased within a lipid membrane through which few water-soluble substances can pass, the membrane contains protein passageways that permit specific substances to move in and out of the cell and allow the cell to exchange information with its environment. We call this delicate skin of protein molecules embedded in a thin sheet of lipid a plasma membrane. This chapter will examine the structure and function of this remarkable membrane. Section 6.1 Biological membranes are fluid layers of lipid. The phospholipid bilayer. The membranes that encase all living cells are sheets of lipid only two molecules thick. More than 10,000 of these sheets piled on one another would just equal the thickness of this sheet of paper. The lipid layer that forms the foundation of a cell membrane is composed of molecules called phospholipids, figure 6.2. Phospholipids. Like the fat molecules you studied in chapter 3, a phospholipid has a backbone derived from a three-carbon molecule called glycerol. Attached to this backbone are fatty acids, long chains of carbon atoms ending in a carboxyl, COOH, group. A fat molecule has three such chains, one attached to each carbon in the backbone, because these chains are nonpolar, they do not form hydrogen bonds with water, and the fat molecule is not water-soluble. A phospholipid, by contrast, has only two fatty acid chains attached to its backbone. The third carbon on the backbone is attached instead to a highly polar organic alcohol that readily forms hydrogen bonds with water. Because this alcohol is attached by a phosphate group, the molecule is called a phospholipid. One end of a phospholipid molecule is, therefore, strongly nonpolar, water insoluble, while the other end is strongly polar, water soluble. The two nonpolar fatty acids extend in one direction roughly parallel to each other, and the polar alcohol group points in the other direction. Because of this structure, phospholipids are often diagrammed as a polar head with two dangling nonpolar tails, as in figure 6.2b. Phospholipids form bilayer sheets. What happens when a collection of phospholipid molecules is placed in water?
The polar water molecules repel the long nonpolar tails of the phospholipids as the water molecules seek partners for hydrogen bonding. Due to the polar nature of the water molecules, the nonpolar tails of the phospholipids end up packed closely together, sequestered as far as possible from water. Every phospholipid molecule orients to face its polar head toward water and its nonpolar tails away. When two layers form with the tails facing each other, no tails ever come in contact with water. The resulting structure is called a lipid bilayer, figure 6.3. Lipid bilayers form spontaneously, driven by the tendency of water molecules to form the maximum number of hydrogen bonds. The nonpolar interior of a lipid bilayer impedes the passage of any water soluble substances through the bilayer, just as a layer of oil impedes the passage of a drop of water, oil and water do not mix. This barrier to the passage of water soluble substances is the key biological property of the lipid bilayer. In addition to the phospholipid molecules that make up the lipid bilayer, the membranes of every cell also contain proteins that extend through the lipid bilayer, providing passageways across the membrane. Synopsis The basic foundation of biological membranes is a lipid bilayer, which forms spontaneously. In such a layer, the nonpolar hydrophobic tails of phospholipid molecules point inward, forming a nonpolar barrier to water soluble molecules. The lipid bilayer is fluid. A lipid bilayer is stable because water's affinity for hydrogen bonding never stops. Just as surface tension holds a soap bubble together, even though it is made of a liquid, so the hydrogen bonding of water holds a membrane together. But while water continually drives phospholipid molecules into this configuration, it does not locate specific phospholipid molecules relative to their neighbors in the bilayer. As a result, individual phospholipids and unanchored proteins are free to move about within the membrane. This can be demonstrated vividly by fusing cells and watching their proteins reassort, figure 6.4. Phospholipid bilayers are fluid, with the viscosity of olive oil, and like oil, their viscosity increases as the temperature decreases. Some membranes are more fluid than others, however. The tails of individual phospholipid molecules are attracted to one another when they line up close together. This causes the membrane to become less fluid, because aligned molecules must pull apart from one another before they can move about in the membrane. The greater the degree of alignment, the less fluid the membrane. Some phospholipid tails do not align well because they contain one or more double bonds between carbon atoms, introducing kinks in the tail. Membranes containing such phospholipids are more fluid than membranes that lack them. Most membranes also contain steroid lipids like cholesterol, which can either increase or decrease membrane fluidity, depending on temperature. Synopsis Section 6.2 Proteins embedded within the plasma membrane determine its character. The Fluid Mosaic Model A plasma membrane is composed of both lipids and globular proteins. For many years, biologists thought the protein covered the inner and outer surfaces of the phospholipid bilayer like a coat of paint. The widely accepted Davson Danielli model, proposed in 1935, portrayed the membrane as a sandwich, a phospholipid bilayer between two layers of globular protein. This model, however, was not consistent with what researchers were learning in the 1960s about the structure of membrane proteins. Unlike most proteins found within cells, membrane proteins are not very soluble in water, they possess long stretches of nonpolar hydrophobic amino acids. If such proteins indeed coated the surface of the lipid bilayer, as the Davson Danielli model suggests, then their nonpolar portions would separate the polar portions of the phospholipids from water, causing the bilayer to dissolve. Because this doesn't happen, there is clearly something wrong with the model. In 1972, S. Singer and G. Nicholson revised the model in a simple but profound way, they proposed that the globular proteins are inserted into the lipid bilayer, with their nonpolar segments in contact with the nonpolar interior of the bilayer and their polar portions protruding out from the membrane surface. In this model, called the fluid mosaic model, a mosaic of proteins float in the fluid lipid bilayer like boats on a pond, figure 6.5. Components of the cell membrane. 
A eukaryotic cell contains many membranes. While they are not all identical, they share the same fundamental architecture. Cell membranes are assembled from four components, Table 6.1. 1. Lipid bilayer. Every cell membrane is composed of a phospholipid bilayer. The other components of the membrane are enmeshed within the bilayer, which provides a flexible matrix and, at the same time, imposes a barrier to permeability. 2. Transmembrane proteins. A major component of every membrane is a collection of proteins that float on or in the lipid bilayer. These proteins provide passageways that allow substances and information to cross the membrane. Many membrane proteins are not fixed in position, they can move about, as the phospholipid molecules do. Some membranes are crowded with proteins, while in others, the proteins are more sparsely distributed. 3. Network of supporting fibers. Membranes are structurally supported by intracellular proteins that reinforce the membrane's shape. For example, a red blood cell has a characteristic biconcave shape because a scaffold of proteins called spectrin links proteins in the plasma membrane with actin filaments in the cell's cytoskeleton. Membranes use networks of other proteins to control the lateral movements of some key membrane proteins, anchoring them to specific sites. 4. Exterior proteins and glycolipids. Membrane sections assemble in the endoplasmic reticulum, transfer to the Golgi complex, and then are transported to the plasma membrane. The endoplasmic reticulum adds chains of sugar molecules to membrane proteins and lipids, creating a sugar coating called the glycocalyx that extends from the membrane on the outside of the cell only. Different cell types exhibit different varieties of these glycoproteins and glycolipids on their surfaces, which act as cell identity markers. Synopsis The fluid mosaic model proposes that membrane proteins are embedded within the lipid bilayer. Membranes are composed of a lipid bilayer within which proteins are anchored. Plasma membranes are supported by a network of fibers and coated on the exterior with cell identity markers. Examining Cell Membranes Biologists examine the delicate, filmy structure of a cell membrane using electron microscopes that provide clear magnification to several thousand times. We discussed two types of electron microscopes in Chapter 5, the Transmission Electron Microscope, TM, and the Scanning Electron Microscope, SEM. When examining cell membranes with electron microscopy, specimens must be prepared for viewing. In one method of preparing a specimen, the tissue of choice is embedded in a hard matrix, usually some sort of epoxy, figure 6.6. .6. The epoxy block is then cut with a microtome, a machine with a very sharp blade that makes incredibly thin slices. The knife moves up and down as the specimen advances toward it, causing transparent epoxy shavings less than 1 micrometer thick to peel away from the block of tissue. These shavings are placed on a grid and a beam of electrons is directed through the grid with the TEM. At the high magnification an electron microscope provides, resolution is good enough to reveal the double layers of a membrane. Freeze fracturing a specimen is another way to visualize the inside of the membrane. The tissue is embedded in a medium and quick frozen with liquid nitrogen. The frozen tissue is then tapped with a knife, causing a crack between the phospholipid layers of membranes. Proteins, carbohydrates, pits, pores, channels, or any other structure affiliated with the membrane will pull apart, hole, usually, and stick with one side of the split membrane. A very thin coating of platinum is then evaporated onto the fractured surface forming a replica of, or, cast, of the surface. Once the topography of the membrane has been preserved in the cast, the actual tissue is dissolved away, and the cast is examined with electron microscopy, creating a strikingly different view of the membrane. See Figure 5.10b. Synopsis Visualizing a plasma membrane requires a very powerful electron microscope. Electrons can either be passed through a sample or bounced off it. Kinds of membrane proteins as we've seen, the plasma membrane is a complex assembly of proteins enmeshed in a fluid array of phospholipid molecules. This enormously flexible design permits a broad range of interactions with the environment, 
some directly involving membrane proteins, figure 6.7. Though cells interact with their environment through their plasma membranes in many ways, we will focus on six key classes of membrane protein in this and the following chapter, chapter 7. 1. Transporters. Membranes are very selective, allowing only certain substances to enter or leave the cell, either through channels or carriers. In some instances, they take up molecules already present in the cell in high concentration. 2. Enzymes. Cells carry out many chemical reactions on the interior surface of the plasma membrane, using enzymes attached to the membrane. 3. Cell surface receptors. Membranes are exquisitely sensitive to chemical messages, detecting them with receptor proteins on their surfaces that act as antennae. 4. Cell surface identity markers. Membranes carry cell surface markers that identify them to other cells. Most cell types carry their own ID tags, specific combinations of cell surface proteins characteristic of that cell type. 5. Cell adhesion proteins. Cells use specific proteins to glue themselves to one another. Some act like Velcro, while others form a more permanent bond. 6. Attachments to the cytoskeleton. Surface proteins that interact with other cells are often anchored to the cytoskeleton by linking proteins. Synopsis. The many proteins embedded within a membrane carry out a host of functions, many of which are associated with transport of materials or information across the membrane. Structure of membrane proteins. If proteins float on lipid bilayers like ships on the sea, how do they manage to extend through the membrane to create channels, and how can certain proteins be anchored into particular positions on the cell membrane? Anchoring proteins in the bilayer. Many membrane proteins are attached to the surface of the membrane by special molecules that associate with phospholipids and thereby anchor the protein to the membrane. Like a ship tied up to a floating dock, these proteins are free to move about on the surface of the membrane tethered to a phospholipid. In contrast, other proteins actually traverse the lipid bilayer. The part of the protein that extends through the lipid bilayer, in contact with the nonpolar interior, consists of one or more nonpolar helices or several beta-pleated sheets of nonpolar amino acids, figure 6.8. Because water avoids nonpolar amino acids much as it does nonpolar lipid chains, the nonpolar portions of the protein are held within the interior of the lipid bilayer. Although the polar ends of the protein protrude from both sides of the membrane, the protein itself is locked into the membrane by its nonpolar segments. Any movement of the protein out of the membrane, in either direction, brings the nonpolar regions of the protein into contact with water, which shoves the protein back into the interior. Extending proteins across the bilayer. Cells contain a variety of different transmembrane proteins, which differ in the way they traverse the bilayer, depending on their functions. Anchors. A single nonpolar segment is adequate to anchor a protein in the membrane. Anchoring proteins of this sort attach the spectrum network of the cytoskeleton to the interior of the plasma membrane, figure 6.9. Many proteins that function as receptors for extracellular signals are also single-pass anchors that pass through the membrane only once. The portion of the receptor that extends out from the cell surface binds to specific hormones or other molecules when the cell encounters them, the binding induces changes at the other end of the protein, in the cell's interior. In this way, information outside the cell is translated into action within the cell. The mechanisms of cell signaling will be addressed in detail in Chapter 7. Channels Other proteins have several helical segments that thread their way back and forth through the membrane, forming a channel like the hole in a donut. For example, bacteriorhodopsin is one of the key transmembrane proteins that carries out photosynthesis in bacteria. It contains seven nonpolar helical segments that traverse the membrane, forming a circular pore through which protons pass during the light-driven pumping of protons, figure 6.10. Other transmembrane proteins do not create channels but rather act as carriers to transport molecules across the membrane. All water-soluble molecules or ions that enter or leave the cell are either transported by carriers or pass through channels. Pores. 
Some transmembrane proteins have extensive nonpolar regions with secondary configurations of pleated sheets instead of alpha helices. The beta sheets form a characteristic motif, folding back and forth in a circle so the sheets come to be arranged like the staves of a barrel. This so-called beta barrel, open on both ends, is a common feature of the porin class of proteins that are found within the outer membrane of some bacteria, figure 6.11. Synopsis Transmembrane proteins are anchored into the bilayer by their nonpolar segments. While anchor proteins may pass through the bilayer only once, many channels and pores are created by proteins that pass back and forth through the bilayer repeatedly, creating a circular hole in the bilayer. 6.3 Passive transport across membranes moves down the concentration gradient. Diffusion Molecules and ions dissolved in water are in constant motion, moving about randomly. This random motion causes a net movement of these substances from regions where their concentration is high to regions where their concentration is lower, a process called diffusion, figure 6.12. Net movement driven by diffusion will continue until the concentrations in all regions are the same. You can demonstrate diffusion by filling a jar to the brim with ink, capping it, placing it at the bottom of a bucket of water, and then carefully removing the cap. The ink molecules will slowly diffuse out from the jar until there is a uniform concentration in the bucket and the jar. This uniformity in the concentration of molecules is a type of equilibrium. Facilitated transport. Many molecules that cells require, including glucose and other energy sources, are polar and cannot pass through the nonpolar interior of the phospholipid bilayer. These molecules enter the cell through specific channels in the plasma membrane. The inside of the channel is polar and thus friendly to the polar molecules, facilitating their transport across the membrane. Each type of biomolecule that is transported across the plasma membrane has its own type of transporter. That is, it has its own channel which fits it like a glove and cannot be used by other molecules. Each channel is said to be selective for that type of molecule, and thus to be selectively permeable, as only molecules admitted by the channels it possesses can enter it. The plasma membrane of a cell has many types of channels, each selective for a different type of molecule. Diffusion of ions through channels one of the simplest ways for a substance to diffuse across a cell membrane is through a channel, as ions do. Ions are solutes, substances dissolved in water, with an unequal number of protons and electrons. Those with an excess of protons are positively charged and called cations. Ions with more electrons are negatively charged and called anions. Because they are charged, ions interact well with polar molecules like water but are repelled by the nonpolar interior of a phospholipid bilayer. Therefore, ions cannot move between the cytoplasm of a cell and the extracellular fluid without the assistance of membrane transport proteins. Ion channels possess a hydrated interior that spans the membrane. Ions can diffuse through the channel in either direction without coming into contact with the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids in the membrane, and the transported ions do not bind to or otherwise interact with the channel proteins. Two conditions determine the direction of net movement of the ions, their relative concentrations on either side of the membrane, and the voltage across the membrane, a topic we'll explore in Chapter 54. Each type of channel is specific for a particular ion, such as calcium, Ca++, or chloride, Cl, or in some cases for a few kinds of ions. Ion channels play an essential role in signaling by the nervous system. Synopsis Diffusion is the net movement of substances to regions of lower concentration as a result of random spontaneous motion. It tends to distribute substances uniformly. Membrane transport proteins allow only certain molecules and ions to diffuse through the plasma membrane. Facilitated diffusion. Carriers, another class of membrane proteins, transport ions as well as other solutes like sugars and amino acids across the membrane. Like channels, carriers are specific for a certain type of solute and can transport substances in either direction across the membrane. Unlike channels, however, they facilitate the movement of solutes across the membrane by physically binding to them on one side of the membrane and releasing them on the other.
Again, the direction of the solute's net movement simply depends on its concentration gradient across the membrane. If the concentration is greater in the cytoplasm, the solute is more likely to bind to the carrier on the cytoplasmic side of the membrane and be released on the extracellular side. This will cause a net movement from inside to outside. If the concentration is greater in the extracellular fluid, the net movement will be from outside to inside. Thus, the net movement always occurs from areas of high concentration to low, just as it does in simple diffusion, but carriers facilitate the process. For this reason, this mechanism of transport is sometimes called facilitated diffusion, figure 6.13. Facilitated diffusion in red blood cells. Several examples of facilitated diffusion by carrier proteins can be found in the membranes of vertebrate red blood cells, RBCs. One RBC carrier protein, for example, transports a different molecule in each direction, Cl- in one direction and bicarbonate ion, HCO3- in the opposite direction. As you will learn in Chapter 52, this carrier is important in transporting carbon dioxide in the blood. A second important facilitated diffusion carrier in RBCs is the glucose transporter. Red blood cells keep their internal concentration of glucose low through a chemical trick. They immediately add a phosphate group to any entering glucose molecule, converting it to a highly charged glucose phosphate that cannot pass back across the membrane. This maintains a steep concentration gradient for glucose, favoring its entry into the cell. The glucose transporter that carries glucose into the cell does not appear to form a channel in the membrane for the glucose to pass through. Instead, the transmembrane protein appears to bind the glucose and then flip its shape, dragging the glucose through the bilayer and releasing it on the inside of the plasma membrane. Once it releases the glucose, the glucose transporter reverts to its original shape. It is then available to bind the next glucose molecule that approaches the outside of the cell. Transport through selective channels saturates. A characteristic feature of transport through selective channels is that its rate is saturable. In other words, if the concentration gradient of a substance is progressively increased, its rate of transport will also increase to a certain point and then level off. Further increases in the gradient will produce no additional increase in rate. The explanation for this observation is that there are a limited number of carriers in the membrane. When the concentration of the transported substance rises high enough, all of the carriers will be in use and the capacity of the transport system will be saturated. In contrast, substances that move across the membrane by simple diffusion, diffusion through channels in the bilayer without the assistance of carriers, do not show saturation. Facilitated diffusion provides the cell with a ready way to prevent the buildup of unwanted molecules within the cell or to take up needed molecules, such as sugars, that may be present outside the cell in high concentrations. Facilitated diffusion has three essential characteristics. 1. It is specific. Any given carrier transports only certain molecules or ions. 2. It is passive. The direction of net movement is determined by the relative concentrations of the transported substance inside and outside the cell. 3. It saturates. If all relevant protein carriers are in use, increases in the concentration gradient do not increase the transport rate. Synopsis Facilitated diffusion is the transport of molecules and ions across a membrane by specific carriers in the direction of lower concentration of those molecules or ions. Osmosis. The cytoplasm of a cell contains ions and molecules, such as sugars and amino acids, dissolved in water. The mixture of these substances and water is called an aqueous solution. Water, the most common of the molecules in the mixture, is the solvent, and the substances dissolved in the water are solutes. The ability of water and solutes to diffuse across membranes has important consequences. Molecules diffuse down a concentration gradient. Both water and solutes diffuse from regions of high concentration to regions of low concentration, that is, they diffuse down their concentration gradients. When two regions are separated by a membrane, what happens depends on whether or not the solutes can pass freely through that membrane. 
Most solutes, including ions and sugars, are not lipid-soluble and, therefore, are unable to cross the lipid bilayer of the membrane. Even water molecules, which are very polar, cannot cross a lipid bilayer. Water flows through aquaporins, which are specialized channels for water. A simple experiment demonstrates this. If you place an amphibian egg in hypotonic spring water, it does not swell. If you then inject aquaporin mRNA into the egg, the channel proteins are expressed and the egg then swells. Dissolved solutes interact with water molecules, which form hydration shells about the charged solute. When there is a concentration gradient of solutes, the solutes will move from a high to a low concentration, dragging with them their hydration shells of water molecules. When a membrane separates two solutions, hydration shell water molecules move with the diffusing ions, creating a net movement of water towards the low solute. This net water movement across a membrane by diffusion is called osmosis, figure 6.14. The concentration of all solutes in a solution determines the osmotic concentration of the solution. If two solutions have unequal osmotic concentrations, the solution with the higher concentration is hyperosmotic, Greek hyper, more than, and the solution with the lower concentration is hypoosmotic, Greek hypo, less than. If the osmotic concentrations of two solutions are equal, the solutions are isosmotic, Greek ISO, the same. In cells, a plasma membrane separates two aqueous solutions, one inside the cell, the cytoplasm, and one outside, the extracellular fluid. The direction of the net diffusion of water across this membrane is determined by the osmotic concentrations of the solutions on either side, figure 6.15. For example, if the cytoplasm of a cell were hypoosmotic to the extracellular fluid, water would diffuse out of the cell, toward the solution with the higher concentration of solutes, and, therefore, the lower concentration of unbound water molecules. This loss of water from the cytoplasm would cause the cell to shrink until the osmotic concentrations of the cytoplasm and the extracellular fluid become equal. Osmotic pressure What would happen if the cell's cytoplasm were hyperosmotic to the extracellular fluid? In this situation, water would diffuse into the cell from the extracellular fluid, causing the cell to swell. The pressure of the cytoplasm pushing out against the cell membrane, or hydrostatic pressure, would increase. On the other hand, the osmotic pressure, figure 6.16, defined as the pressure that must be applied to stop the osmotic movement of water across a membrane, would also be at work. If the membrane were strong enough, the cell would reach an equilibrium, at which the osmotic pressure, which tends to drive water into the cell, is exactly counterbalanced by the hydrostatic pressure, which tends to drive water back out of the cell. However, a plasma membrane by itself cannot withstand large internal pressures, and an isolated cell under such conditions would burst like an overinflated balloon. Accordingly, it is important for animal cells to maintain isosmotic conditions. The cells of bacteria, fungi, plants, and many protists, in contrast, are surrounded by strong cell walls. The cells of these organisms can withstand high internal pressures without bursting. Maintaining Osmotic Balance Organisms have developed many solutions to the osmotic dilemma posed by being hyperosmotic to their environment. Extrusion some single-celled eukaryotes like the protist paramecium use organelles called contractile vacuoles to remove water. Each vacuole collects water from various parts of the cytoplasm and transports it to the central part of the vacuole, near the cell surface. The vacuole possesses a small pore that opens to the outside of the cell. By contracting rhythmically, the vacuole pumps the water out of the cell through the pore. Isosmotic Solutions some organisms that live in the ocean adjust their internal concentration of solutes to match that of the surrounding seawater. Isosmotic with respect to their environment, there is no net flow of water into or out of these cells. Many terrestrial animals solve the problem in a similar way, by circulating a fluid through their bodies that bathes cells in an isosmotic solution. The blood in your body, for example, contains a high concentration of the protein albumin, which elevates the solute concentration of the blood to match your cells. Turgor. 
Most plant cells are hyperosmotic to their immediate environment, containing a high concentration of solutes in their central vacuoles. The resulting internal hydrostatic pressure, known as turgor pressure, presses the plasma membrane firmly against the interior of the cell wall, making the cell rigid. The newer, softer portions of trees and shrubs depend on turgor pressure to maintain their shape and wilt when they lack sufficient water. Synopsis Osmosis is the diffusion of water, but not solutes, across a membrane. Section 6.4 Bulk transport utilizes endocytosis. Bulk passage into and out of the cell. Endocytosis The lipid nature of their biological membranes raises a second problem for cells. The substances cells use as fuel are for the most part large, polar molecules that cannot cross the hydrophobic barrier a lipid bilayer creates. How do organisms get these substances into their cells? One process many single-celled eukaryotes employ is endocytosis, figure 6.17. In this process the plasma membrane extends outward and envelopes food particles. Cells use three major types of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Phagocytosis and pinocytosis. If the material the cell takes in is particulate, made up of discrete particles, such as an organism or some other fragment of organic matter, figure 6.17a, the process is called phagocytosis, Greek phagian, to eat, plus cytos, cell. If the material the cell takes in is liquid, figure 6.17b, it is called pinocytosis, Greek pinean, to drink. Pinocytosis is common among animal cells. Mammalian egg cells, for example, nurse from surrounding cells, the nearby cells secrete nutrients that the maturing egg cell takes up by pinocytosis. Virtually all eukaryotic cells constantly carry out these kinds of endocytosis, trapping particles and extracellular fluid in vesicles and ingesting them. Endocytosis rates vary from one cell type to another. They can be surprisingly high, some types of white blood cells ingest 25% of their cell volume each hour. Receptor-mediated endocytosis Specific molecules are often transported into eukaryotic cells through receptor-mediated endocytosis. Molecules to be transported first bind to specific receptors on the plasma membrane. The transport process is specific because only that molecule has a shape that fits snugly into the receptor. The plasma membrane of a particular kind of cell contains a characteristic battery of receptor types, each for a different kind of molecule. The interior portion of the receptor molecule resembles a hook that is trapped in an indented pit coated with the protein clathrin. The pits act like molecular mousetraps, closing over to form an internal vesicle when the right molecule enters the pit. Figure 6.18. The trigger that releases the trap is a receptor protein embedded in the membrane of the pit, which detects the presence of a particular target molecule and reacts by initiating endocytosis. The process is highly specific and very fast. One type of molecule that is taken up by receptor mediated endocytosis is called a low density lipoprotein, LDL. The LDL molecules bring cholesterol into the cell where it can be incorporated into membranes. Cholesterol plays a key role in determining the stiffness of the body's membranes. In the human genetic disease called hypercholesteremia, the receptors lack tails and so are never caught in the clathrin coated pits and, thus, are never taken up by the cells. The cholesterol stays in the bloodstream of affected individuals, coating their arteries and leading to heart attacks. Fluid phase endocytosis is the receptor-mediated pinocytosis of fluids. It is important to understand that endocytosis in itself does not bring substances directly into the cytoplasm of a cell. The material taken in is still separated from the cytoplasm by the membrane of the vesicle. Exocytosis The reverse of endocytosis is exocytosis, the discharge of material from vesicles at the cell surface, figure 6.19. In plant cells, exocytosis is an important means of exporting the materials needed to construct the cell wall through the plasma membrane. Among protists, contractile vacuole discharge is a form of exocytosis.
In animal cells, exocytosis provides a mechanism for secreting many hormones, neurotransmitters, digestive enzymes, and other substances. Synopsis Cells import bulk materials by engulfing them with their plasma membranes in a process called endocytosis, similarly, they extrude or secrete material through exocytosis. Section 6.5 Active transport across membranes is powered by energy from ATP. Active transport. While diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis are passive transport processes that move materials down their concentration gradients, cells can also move substances across the membrane up their concentration gradients. This process requires the expenditure of energy, typically ATP, and is therefore called active transport. Like facilitated diffusion, active transport involves highly selective protein carriers within the membrane. These carriers bind to the transported substance, which could be an ion or a simple molecule like a sugar, figure 6.20, an amino acid, or a nucleotide to be used in the synthesis of DNA. Active transport is one of the most important functions of any cell. It enables a cell to take up additional molecules of a substance that is already present in its cytoplasm in concentrations higher than in the extracellular fluid. Without active transport, for example, liver cells would be unable to accumulate glucose molecules from the blood plasma, as the glucose concentration is often higher inside the liver cells than it is in the plasma. Active transport also enables a cell to move substances from its cytoplasm to the extracellular fluid despite higher external concentrations. The sodium-potassium pump. The use of ATP in active transport may be direct or indirect. Let's first consider how ATP is used directly to move ions against their concentration gradient. More than one-third of all of the energy expended by an animal cell that is not actively dividing is used in the active transport of sodium, Na+, and potassium, K+, ions. Most animal cells have a low internal concentration of Na+, relative to their surroundings, and a high internal concentration of K+. They maintain these concentration differences by actively pumping Na+, out of the cell and K+, in. The remarkable protein that transports these two ions across the cell membrane is known as the sodium-potassium pump, figure 6.21. The cell obtains the energy it needs to operate the pump from adenosine triphosphate, ATP, a molecule we'll learn more about in Chapter 8. The important characteristic of the sodium-potassium pump is that it is an active transport process, transporting Na plus and K plus from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. This transport up their concentration gradients is the opposite of the passive transport in diffusion, it is achieved only by the constant expenditure of metabolic energy. The sodium-potassium pump works through a series of conformational changes in the transmembrane protein. Step 1. Three sodium ions bind to the cytoplasmic side of the protein, causing the protein to change its conformation. Step 2. In its new conformation, the protein binds a molecule of ATP and cleaves it into adenosine diphosphate and phosphate, ADP plus PI. ADP is released, but the phosphate group remains bound to the protein. The protein is now phosphorylated. Step 3. The phosphorylation of the protein induces a second conformational change in the protein. This change translocates the 3 Na plus across the membrane, so they now face the exterior. In this new conformation, the protein has a low affinity for Na+, and the three bound Na+, dissociate from the protein and diffuse into the extracellular fluid. Step 4. The new conformation has a high affinity for K+, two of which bind to the extracellular side of the protein as soon as it is free of the Na+. Step 5. The binding of the K+, causes another conformational change in the protein, this time resulting in the dissociation of the bound phosphate group. Step 6. Freed of the phosphate group, the protein reverts to its original conformation, exposing the 2K plus to the cytoplasm. This conformation has a low affinity for K plus, so the two bound K plus dissociate from the protein and diffuse into the interior of the cell. The original conformation has a high affinity for Na plus, 
when these ions bind, they initiate another cycle. 3Na plus leave the cell and 2K plus enter in every cycle. The changes in protein conformation that occur during the cycle are rapid, enabling each carrier to transport as many as 300 Na plus per second. The sodium-potassium pump appears to be ubiquitous in animal cells, although cells vary widely in the number of pump proteins they contain. Synopsis Active transport moves a solute across a membrane up its concentration gradient, using protein carriers driven by the expenditure of chemical energy. Coupled transport Many molecules are transported into cells up a concentration gradient through a process that uses ATP indirectly. The molecules move hand in hand with sodium ions or protons that are moving down their concentration gradients. This type of active transport, called cotransport, has two components. 1. Establishing the down gradient. ADP is used to establish the sodium ion or proton down gradient, which is greater than the up gradient of the molecule to be transported. 2. Traversing the up gradient. Cotransport proteins, also called coupled transport proteins, carry the molecule and either a sodium ion or a proton together across the membrane. Because the down gradient of the sodium ion or proton is greater than the up gradient of the molecule to be transported, the net movement across the membrane is in the direction of the down gradient, typically into the cell. Establishing the down gradient Either the sodium-potassium pump or the proton pump establishes the down gradient that powers most active transport processes of the cell. The sodium-potassium pump The sodium-potassium pump actively pumps sodium ions out of the cell, powered by energy from ATP. This establishes a sodium ion concentration gradient that is lower inside the cell. The proton pump The proton pump pumps protons, H plus ions, across a membrane using energy derived from energy-rich molecules or from photosynthesis. This creates a proton gradient, in which the concentration of protons is higher on one side of the membrane than the other. Membranes are impermeable to protons, so the only way protons can diffuse back down their concentration gradient is through a second cotransport protein. Traversing the up gradient Animal cells accumulate many amino acids and sugars against a concentration gradient, the molecules are transported into the cell from the extracellular fluid, even though their concentrations are higher inside the cell. These molecules couple with sodium ions to enter the cell down the Na plus concentration gradient established by the sodium-potassium pump. In this cotransport process, Na plus and a specific sugar or amino acid simultaneously bind to the same transmembrane protein on the outside of the cell, called a symport, figure 6.22. Both are then translocated to the inside of the cell, but in the process Na plus moves down its concentration gradient while the sugar or amino acid moves up its concentration gradient. In effect, the cell uses some of the energy stored in the Na plus concentration gradient to accumulate sugars and amino acids. In a related process, called countertransport, the inward movement of Na plus is coupled with the outward movement of another substance, such as Ca plus plus or H plus. As in cotransport, both Na plus and the other substance bind to the same transport protein, in this case called an antiport, but in this case they bind on opposite sides of the membrane and are moved in opposite directions. In countertransport, the cell uses the energy released as Na plus moves down its concentration gradient into the cell to extrude a substance up its concentration gradient. The cell uses the proton down gradient established by the proton pump, figure 6.23, in ATP production. The movement of protons through their cotransport protein is coupled to the production of ATP, the energy storing molecule we mentioned earlier. Thus, the cell expends energy to produce ATP, which provides it with a convenient energy storage form that it can employ in its many activities. The coupling of the proton pump to ATP synthesis, called chemiosmosis, is responsible for almost all of the ATP produced from food, see Chapter 9 and all of the ATP produced by photosynthesis, see chapter 10. We know that proton pump proteins are ancient because they are present in bacteria as well as in eukaryotes.
The mechanisms for transport across plasma membranes are summarized in Table 6.2. Synopsis Many molecules are co-transport into cells up their concentration gradients by coupling their movement to that of sodium ions or protons moving down their concentration gradients.